seven. Everywhere else, one eight six 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 three six six two eight. We're online at do the math online dot net and on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Perfect. So after you get through with that, we'll talk about where you school. What do you like about school? What do you not like about school? Whatever happens to come up. Okay. Sound good? Can I
Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and Kern High School District, with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. I'm Cindy. And in studio with us, we have Maddie. And Maddie, if somebody needed to contact us, what would they need to do? For math homework, help call in Bakersfield 636-4357. Everywhere else, 1-866-636-6284. Email dothemath at kern.org. We're online at dothemathonline.net. And on social and media, Facebook, me, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right, nicely done. So do you have all that social media stuff? Some of it. So what do you have? I have YouTube, that's it. So you look at YouTube and check stuff out every once in a while? All the time. Or do you have your own YouTube channel, I think is what it would be, right? I want to, but well, I don't. Well, guess what? You're going to be YouTube famous <laughs> later on tonight, all right? So where do you go to school and what grade are you in? I go to Kendrick Elementary School and I'm in fifth grade. How is fifth grade? Good. What's so good about it? Uh, everything. Give me one thing. It's fun. Oh, what's so fun about it? Uh, the learning part. Learning what? Math. Such as? Um, volume. So you like doing volume, so this is something that you've recently done then? Kind of. Kind of. What is something that you've done in math that you feel like it's never going to be a problem again. You've got it, and you're good with it. Multiplication. So you're pretty good at multiplying. Yes. Good. Well, you're going to need to know that in order to do volume. Yes. So what do you know about volume right now? I know that volume equals length times width times height. And that's if you're doing something like a prism, correct? Yes. Would everything be the same if you were doing a cylinder? Do you know what that is? Uh, like a tall... Circle kind of? Yeah, yeah, you're on the right track. I'm just asking in case there's something different, maybe. I don't know. I mean, we'll, we'll check that out, okay? All right. So, have you been at Kendrick for a long time? Since second grade. Since second grade. Are they, what, are they the Eagles or Cougars? What are they? Cougars. Cougars. All right, I was close. I, all right, so Kendrick Cougars. I figured it had to be a K sound, so <laughs> Kendrick Cougars. So, you're going to help me out with a problem right now. You ready? Yes. This is the social media problem of the day. So all that social media stuff that you read before, we have one of our producers put out a problem on social media, and this is one that was presented today. So remember I said you need to help me out with division. So what does that problem say? It says 527 divided by 8. So what's the first thing you would do with that? So I would see what kind, what, what equals, what times 8 equals close to 52. Good. And what times 8 is close to 52? Well, I would cross out because 7 times 8 equals 56. Good. But then I think 8 times 6 is 48, so that's really close. So I would say 6. So you would say 6. So looking at the options that we have there, A, B, C, and D, do you know what the answer is already? Yes. What? C. Why? Because it starts with a it starts with a six and none of the others do. Right, so we can do this one pretty quickly without even yes. having to actually do the whole problem. Yes. Now I've got another question for you because I'm, I'm feeling pretty good with you about C also. Mm -hmm. But it says R, there, there's R's in these things. Yes. Usually you don't see that, what does that mean? It means remainder. So how do we get that? So if, they, if it doesn't, if it doesn't, uh, if you can't do it equally, then you have to, you have to add, you have to, you have to you have to do the remainder. Okay. 
So when you said eight times six was 48, we would take away 48 from 52, what would be left? Let's see here, 52, uh, that would be four. Excellent, and I like the way you're doing that because you do whatever you need to in order to get to the answer, right? Yes. So we've got a four, and then what do we do with the seven? Then we bring it down. Okay, so now we have 47. Yes. So what would eight times what be close to 47? Five, because I know that six times eight equals 48, like we mentioned earlier, then it would, then it would have to be five equals 40. Very good. And what would be left? It would be seven. And that's where we're getting our remainder seven yes. from? All right, so let's take a look and see if we are indeed correct with answer C. There you go, nicely done. First problem, all done. Feeling pretty good? Yes. It's pretty easy, isn't it? Very. <laughs> well, just wait. Now that you said it's very easy, we're going to give you some other problems to work with. But first, let's take a look at today's Math in the News. So today's Math in the News has to deal with a topic that is coming up tomorrow. Do you know what tomorrow is? Yes. What is Combining it? Combining volume. Combining volumes. It is combining volume tomorrow in your math class, correct? Yes. Well, that is excellent that you know what is coming up tomorrow. Do you know what else is happening tomorrow? Uh, you, uh, no. All right. Take a look at the screen that I've got right here. Uh -huh. What is that? Groundhog Day. Have you ever heard of Groundhog Day? Yes. What do you know about Groundhog Day? Um, so, I don't know where, but there's a special groundhog, and it comes out on Grand, um, Groundhog Day, and they celebrate it. There you go. Well, that's a, a pretty succinct way of saying it. Yes. So the place they do this is in Punxsutawney. Can you say that? Punk, pu Punxsutawney. Punxsutawney? And that's in Pennsylvania. Oh. You know where Pennsylvania is? The United States of America. Excellent. That is a good answer. It is in the United States of America. Do you think it's near California or on the other side of the country? Other side. Ooh, you're sharp. So you know a little bit of geography right there. So what they do is in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, they have this groundhog named Phil. Phil. So. All right. And they pull him out once a year. And do you know what the shadow, no shadow thing means? Um, I've, I've, I've learned about it before, but I forgot it. So, if he sees his shadow, it means we're going to have a little more winter, right? Mm -hmm. No shadow, spring's supposed to come a little earlier, oh. okay? Now, this is a big deal to a lot of people in a lot of the country because in wintertime, they have very cold temperatures and a lot of snow. Here in California, we don't have that, do we? Yeah, we All don't. right. So, let's take a look at uh, a little bit more about the history of Groundhog Day, right? So, it's in Pennsylvania, right? The Dutch settlers came up with this, all right? Mm -hmm. Europeans that came over. And uh, they needed to have candles needed for winter, so this is part of where they're figuring out how much more winter are we going to have, all right? Mm -hmm. So I figured let's take a look at the percentages of how successful Punxsutawney Phil is. So you said you wanted to learn a little bit about percentages today. Yes. Because you're going to be doing it in fifth grade, but you haven't done it yet. Yes. So here we've got from 2012 to 2021, what his correct predictions have been, all right? So he said, well, he saw his shadow, right? And the temperatures in February were cold, right? They were below what it should be and above the next month. Mm -hmm. So did Phil get it right? No, he didn't get it right because he said we were going to have more winter, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. Here... He said we were going to have a, a good spring, right, an early spring. Mm -hmm. So here we did have warmer temperatures, so that meant for an earlier spring, warmer mm -hmm. temperatures. So that's why he gets the check mark. He's done it correctly. Mm -hmm. All right. So how many years do we have here? Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten. Okay. Now, if you had all ten correct, let's say you were doing ten problems on a test, mm -hmm. what would your percent be if you got them all right? hundred percent. A hundred percent. Now, if you only had one wrong, do you know what it would be? It would be nine out of ten. Ninety. Ninety percent. Okay. So that's basically how this is working. So we can look over here. How many green checks does Phil have? He has 
four. So he has 40% success rate. Do you think being correct 40% of the time is good or bad? Bad. Bad. Phil needs a little work, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he needs to get a little better at his predicting right there as far as the shadow, no shadow. And keep in mind, this is just an animal. Yeah. And the whole myth and stuff like that, right? So you, you kind of just have a little bit of fun with it, right? Yeah. Here's another percentage thing for you, probability. If I had a coin, mm -hmm. what are the two sides of the coin? Do you know what those are called? Heads and tails. Heads and tails, right? Mm -hmm. What's the probability that if I toss a coin, it's going to come up heads? 50%. How do you know that? Why did you come up with 50%? Because on one side, it's heads, and then the other side, it's tails. And it There's only two outcomes, right? Yeah. So you're able to get heads one out of two times, mm -hmm. right? That's, you can only, get, you've got a half and half shot mm -hmm. of getting it, right? So it's 50%, mm -hmm. okay? So he has a 50% shot at getting it right every year also, right? Mm -hmm. It's either gonna be early spring or late, mm -hmm. one or the other. Mm -hmm. And he's only right 40% of the time. So did you know that there's, and so Punxsutawney Phil is pretty famous, right? Yes. You've heard of him in Groundhog's Day. Yes. Did you know that there's a, an animal locally just as famous? There is. And twice as good as Phil. What would twice as good be if he's 40%? 80%. This guy, even better. That's pretty good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at who it is. Have you ever been to Calm? Have you heard of Calm? Yes, my grandma used to work there. Stop the business. Have you been there? Of Pretty much all the time. Did you ever help out all the other time? Um, Sometimes, because you were probably a little mm, younger, right? Yeah, I was really right. young. Do you remember what your grandma did there? Yes, she would walk out and she would like hold the snakes for other people to like pet it or with the tortoises or... Oh good, so she was it. handling the animals and taking care of them and things like that, mm -hmm. right? So would you handle the snake and hold it too? Yes. You like that, huh? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. What as about long as it's not poisonous. So. Well, that's a, probably a wise choice right there because yes. I wouldn't do that either. So cinnamon is one of the black bears at Calm. And cinnamon, what they do is they put the logo of the teams in the Super Bowl. Do you know what the Super Bowl is? Yes. It's, um, I forgot what sport it is. It's a football game. All right. Mm -hmm. So every year people like to bet on who's going to win the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. right? And if there's only two choices, what do you think your shots are getting it correct? 50%. 50%, okay. So Sid, Cinnamon, mm -hmm. they put food in each of these containers. Mm -hmm. And whichever one Sid goes to first and eats, that, they're saying that's who he thinks is going to win the Super Bowl. Now, does he really have an idea of what's going on? No, Cinnamon is just a bear. Right, he's just a bear. Okay? Animals. But when he goes and eats these things, he's been right 85% of the time. Oh, wow. So do you think it would be a good bet to follow what Cinnamon does or Phil? Cinnamon. There you go. All right. You know what? You're learning quite a bit today on uh, probability odds and stuff like that. And that is today's Math in the News. So we do have uh, Groundhog Day coming up tomorrow. But keep in mind, our uh, buddy Punxsutawney Phil, about a 40% success rate. Cinnamon, here at Calm, 85%. So you, young lady, are getting ready to do a little bit of math. You've already taught us a little bit about what volume is. Yes. And we're going to have you start doing some volume, but you're going to do it right after this. Hello and welcome to the International Space Station. My name is Shane Kimbrough and I'm an astronaut living and working here 250 miles above the Earth. Today we're going to be learning about what a simple machine is and exploring the different ways we're using simple machines up here in low Earth orbit. A simple machine is an object that helps us to easily accomplish a task by changing the direction or amount of a force. There are six different types of simple machines. A screw, inclined plane, wedge, lever, wheel, and axle, and pulley. When we combine two or more of these simple machines together, they are called compound machines. 
Let's dive into the purpose of each of these devices and how we are using them up here on the station. A screw is a simple machine that helps to fasten two objects together. Up here we use a variety of screws in order to keep our station intact, especially as we deal with microgravity causing objects to drift around. Here's an example of a screw that we may use on a spacewalk. Inclined planes are a broad range of simple machines that use an angled plane to accomplish different tasks. Down on Earth, you use inclined planes to move things easily. But here in microgravity, we don't need inclined planes to help us move objects. If you look closely at a screw, you will see that it is made up of a rod with an inclined plane that spirals around it. This inclined plane helps the screw to fasten to another object. Another simple machine using inclined planes to accomplish something is a wedge. The wedge consists of two inclined planes combined to split or separate objects. We often use wedges to cut objects here on the International Space Station. A wheel and axle is, is exactly what it sounds like. A wheel is attached to an axle, helping it to rotate and move easily without friction. We sometimes use wheels to help move items that we need to be able to travel without floating away. An example of this would be the wheels on our crew equipment and translation aid cart. It is attached to a track using wheel and axles for movement, so we are able to use it on our spacewalks without the possibility of it drifting off. I mentioned compound machines before, and our Advanced Resistive Exercise Device, or ARED, is a great example of that. It combines the simple machines, levers, and pulleys to help us maintain muscle and bone density in micro-G. Levers use a surface situated on a fulcrum, or pivoting point, to move an object. Pulleys are simple machines that use a wheel and axle to change the direction of an object. The pulleys inside ARED allow us to set the level of resistance for our workouts. Thank you for learning about simple machines with me today. Now I'm going to send you back to Earth to design a compound machine you think we could use up here on the International Space Station. See you next time. Well, simple machines may be simple, but they are quite integral to every part of everyday life. Have you studied about simple machines at all in school yet? Um, I think I have. You think you have. So do you remember hearing about the pulleys and levers yes. and fulcrums and wheels and axles and things like that? Yes. All right. So if you know those simple machines, you can develop more compound machines. Um, and if you're like, I don't remember kind of that stuff, just ask your teacher. Say, hey, can we uh, do a little bit with some simple machines? And Because they're fun to play around with. and. Mm -hmm experiment and play with and see how everything works. You like doing that kind of stuff? Yes. Take things apart, kind of see how they work on the inside? Yes. All right, cool. You ready to do some work finally? You've just been kind of hanging out all day. <laughs> yeah. You ready? Uh -huh. All right, over to the board, young lady. We're going to put this up on uh, under the camera first, though. This is the problem that is in your math book. This is the homework problem you have. And you have where you have to find volume, but these aren't simple figures. They're rather complex. Yes. All right. And you said you know a little bit about volume, but you don't like these ones necessarily because you haven't worked with them yet, right? Yeah. So Cindy's going to help you, but you have to let her know how you would start and what you know already. Okay. All right. Go to it. So I would, so I would have to find the length times the width times the height. Okay. So I, had to, so I would have to find the length the width and the height. Okay. So does this look like one basic rectangular prism? No. It looks like, what's it look like? It looks like a bench. Okay. So do you, can you picture it as two rectangular prisms? Yes. Where could you split it up to make it look like two rectangular prisms? Uh, you could either split it right here or you could split it right there. Yeah. So either I'll one. Choose I'll choose that one. Okay, so you're looking at like two side-by-side -side rectangular mm -hmm. prisms. Okay. So. so now that you have it as two parts, what could we do with the volume to find the volume of the whole thing? What do you think? I think since uh, when I look up here, that's three. So it's basically right here. So I would put a tiny three. 
So, so this, you're talking about for this piece right here? Yeah. Okay. Oops. Uh, so I would have to find the length, the width, and the height. Okay. So once I find it, I would label it with the L, the W, or the H. Okay, so you're going to find the volume for this side right now? Yes. Okay, go for it. So I see a 9. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, then it would probably be like straight back. Um, so I would put that as the, the length. Okay. So I'll put an L. Okay. Then I would, well, we have this, which it, we have this, which is the, the width, okay. I believe. Sounds so good. I'll put the, whoops. That's fine. We know what it is, right? <laughs> uh. Okay. Uh, so now that's all left. That one thing that's left is the H, which is the height. So I would have to find the height, which is if I look at it this way, if we just look at it, it looks just like a, a tri. I mean, not a triangle, a, a rectangle. Okay. So this looks like the height over here. Okay. Right, because this oh. would be the same. Is that right? Yes. All right, so you have your three numbers. So we multiply them together, I and believe. And then that'll give us this side. Okay, go for yes. it. Yes. I'm just going to label this A, and then I'm going to label this uh, B. Okay. Sounds like a good idea. Okay. So um, multiply it together. So I know that 9 times 3 is 27. So we do 27 times 3. 3 times 7 is uh, 21. Then 3 times 2 is 6, plus 2 is 8. So for that, it would be, I think it's like that. It is, yes. Um, okay, good, that's correct. Uh, so before you move on, I know you yes. said that you think it's like that. Yes. Why? Because I'm not sure because we haven't really like... Well, then blitzed. talk to Cindy about it because we want to make sure you know why you're doing that. Okay? Okay. Okay, so do you know what volume represents? Like, volume is like, it's the whole thing. So it's like how many cubic yeah. units, cubic units you can fit inside. Yes. And then this three is read as, this is read as cubic inches. Mm -hmm. And so this just represents that. It's representing that you're filling it with cubes. So if I did a model, this is what my teacher said to us. So if you took an empty tissue box and you filled it with like little blocks, mm -hmm. then that would be the volume. Exactly, yeah. And then those volumes are, or I mean those, those blocks are cubes, which makes that a three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay, now, so let's do part B. Part B. Or box B, or prism B. It's hard to look at it because I don't know okay, what's Okay, so let's, if I go like that, does that help? Yes. Okay, so this is a three like over there because three plus three is six, of course. Uh, that be like that. Okay. Then, it's kind of hard because I don't know. All right, do you get confused slanted. what might be length and what might be width? Um, I mean, sometimes when it's like really big. So or, let me ask you this. In your, could I take a box and say it's sitting like this and then I turn it like this? Yeah. Is it the same box? Uh, well it's the same box. Yeah, but you does it have the same it. volume? Yes. Yeah, so it doesn't really matter which one you technically label as length or width, it's gonna come out oh. the same because it's representing the same amount of space. Oh. So if you get confused like, ah, I don't know which one looks like which, you know, you just have to kind of pick. Okay. But I'd say like since we said this is height, we should say this is height. Yeah. Because that way it matches up with what you did before. Do you think that I, I can't tell? Is this like straight? So this is, and then like that. It's like, <laughs> like this is the top of a box and this is oh. the front facing you kind of. Kind of how this one was. This oh, was the front and this okay, is the top. Okay, I get it. Yeah? I get it. See it now? I think, okay, yeah, I think I, yeah, I, I got it now. Okay. okay. So. This would be the length, and then 
No, it's the lane. Because over there, it'll work as the lane. Well, this one was the lane, yeah. and this was the height, which would be the same as this. It's okay. Oh, put that. It doesn't. It comes out the same. Because, like oh, you said, yeah. you could just turn it and yeah. reshape it, and it still has because the same it's volume. multiplication mm -hmm. and commutative property. But definitely not called. for division or subtraction, but like. Exactly. So it would be 3 times 6 times 9. So I like to do, um, I think I'll do um, 3 times 6. That would be 18. Oh. I did. 19. Uh -huh. Oops. There you go. <laughs> 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 All right, that's something. I think you combine numbers and letters there, I think. Just go ahead and erase it, Maddie, and start over again. There you go. <laughs> All right, so you did 3 okay. times 6 is 18. Then we do a 9. Okay, so 9 times 8 is 72. Then 9 times 1 is 9, of course. Then we add 7. I like to think of it that I subtract 1 from the, like, 7. Then I add it to the 9. Then it would be 10. Then I add the 6, so it would be 16. So you can do it in your head better, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. All right, so now we have each piece. So what do you think we should do to get the volume of everything? Add it. Sounds like a good idea. I have a question. Okay. Do I put the three? You on still the keep it as three because it's still representing filling each one with cubes, which is a three label. Oh, okay. So well, that's that, a good question. I, I what like do you that think you it would have been if it wasn't a three? If you weren't sure, what do you think you would have put? I would have just put two hundred forty-three inches. But we need three to make yeah. sure it's cubic inches. All yeah. right. Nicely done. Great problem right there. So what I'd like you to do is quickly take a look at something like this. Would this be something you could figure out the volume of. Yes. So you would just have to take this part, mm -hmm. right? Kind of like up there, you had two prisms next mm -hmm. to each other. This one doesn't go all the way over like this, mm -hmm. but it's still kind of the same thing that mm -hmm. you're doing, right? Yeah. I've got a question before you start the next one. Mm -hmm. Is there a way, do you think, do you see how that section is taken out above A? Like it's removed? Uh, yes. Like think about this, like this open area, mm -hmm. right? Do you think if I, could just take the whole solid and take this away, I would get the same answer. So if you just took, like, took it apart? If I filled this in, let's say, uh -huh. right? And I just said the volume of this whole thing and then took this away. Because what you're doing is you're doing the volume of two separate pieces uh -huh. and adding them together. Uh -huh. What I wanna know is do you think I could take the volume of the whole thing if this was filled in, and then take away this part. Do you think that might work? Well, I don't think that it would be because um, that because there's basically two of those, uh, that box on top, and then there's like some over here. Okay, so that's the way we're gonna keep doing it. All right, that's the way you like it, that's the way you understand mm -hmm. it, and that's the way we're gonna do it. So let's go to the next problem right now. And you did some excellent work on that, so what do you think of this one? Lots of numbers. <laughs> you think you can handle that one? Yes. Go to it. Okay. So, so that this is like a big rectangular prism with a little one on top. Yeah. So it's so I'll just say like it's a box right there and then a box right here. So like okay. that. I split it. In, I'll split it apart. Okay. I'm just gonna erase that because. 
Okay, so I would split the the little cube on top of this, the 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 rectangle, rectangular the rectangular prism, the rectangular prism, um, and then I'll save the little one for later. Okay. So I look at it. So that's the the width. Then, right. so it's just basically five times three, which is fifteen, because fifteen plus, times one, it's same, it's fifteen. So put fifteen. Oh, it's different. I'm just gonna put inches. Okay. Okay. So. Then I look up there. It's 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 a cube, so all of the sides are the same. So it'd be two two on each side. Right. So it would just be two times two times two. So I write it up here. So I know that two times two is four. So I'll put a four down. Times two equals eight. So I would put eight. Then I would have to add it up again. So 15 plus 8. So that would be, I just take it, take a, one away and I'll save it for later. 4 plus 8 is 12. Then I add it back, which is 13. Oh, what happened? <laughs> it's okay, you moved it. That's all right. I fixed it. Got like a little hocus pocus on that screen right there. <laughs> I'm making it do all sorts of stuff. So nicely done. So you're feeling pretty good about 23 cubic feet? Yes. What do you think, Cindy? Looks good. All right, nicely done right there. I especially appreciate how you, without having Cindy have to tell you to put the units on there also, because a lot of students will just leave 23 and it'll be marked wrong. Yes. Some will even put 23 feet, and guess what it is? Wrong. Wrong. It's got to be 23 feet to the third power, or cubed. Mm -hmm. Now, 23, it's funny you bring that up, because it's the year 2023, <laughs> the year of Donnie. Do you know who Donnie is? No. No, oh, a lot of people don't. But for some of the adults out there, no, Don Mattingly, number 23. So it, it, it's just funny that it came out to be number 23 right there. <laughs> Have you ever been to Chick-fil-A? Yes, I live next to it. You live next to it? Yes. I wish I lived next to it, then I could go to a little time. Well, for doing some great work so far, you've got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at Chick-fil-A, so congratulations on that. What's your favorite thing over there? Uh, probably the ice cream. I love, I love the ice cream because it tastes like homemade ice cream, and I love homemade ice cream. It tastes different than regular ice cream. You make your own homemade ice cream? Uh, I've done it before. You've done it before, and you like the homemade ice cream? Yes. Is there a particular flavor you make all the time? Uh, vanilla. Vanilla. And I'm sure that's what you get at Chick-fil-A. Yes. Well, guess what? When you go, tell Troy to throw an ice cream cone on there for you too, all right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hey, you know what? We do have phone tutors available most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year until 5.30 in the afternoon. We'll be back with more right after this. My name is Megan MacArthur. And my name is Shane Kimbrough. We are living and working aboard the International Space Station orbiting 250 miles above your head. Here on station we live in a microgravity environment which allows us to experiment with weightlessness and push the boundaries of science. Today we will demonstrate moment of inertia by first using a large flashlight then demonstrating it with the human body. Are you ready? Let's go check it out. Inertia is the tendency of an object to resist change in its current state of motion. That might sound familiar since Newton's first law of motion is also referred to as the law of inertia. 
Moment of inertia, on the other hand, describes an object's tendency to resist rotational acceleration. An object's moment of inertia is a property that depends on how mass is distributed around its axis of rotation. There is a relationship between an object's mass distribution and how easily it spins or resists spinning. In general, objects have a lower moment of inertia and are easier to spin if the mass is closer to the axis of rotation. As you can see, the flashlight rotating about its longer axis is spinning at a faster rate than the flashlight rotating about its shorter axis. This is because its mass is closer to the axis of rotation. The spinning flashlight in this position has a lower moment of inertia, which means there is less resistance to rotation. When the flashlight is spun about its shorter axis, its mass is spread further away from the axis of rotation. In this position, the flashlight has a higher moment of inertia. Now let's see if this applies to humans as well. Notice how fast Megan is spinning in relation to her body's position. When her arms are tucked in tightly next to her body, her moment of inertia decreases, which causes her to spin faster. When her arms are extended out, more mass is pulled further away from the axis of rotation, which increases her moment of inertia and causes her to spin slower. This happens because redistributing our mass changes our moment of inertia, which in turn changes how fast we spin. Thanks for coming aboard and watching our demonstration today. To explore more on moment of inertia, check out the classroom connection lesson that goes along with this video and discover many other lessons and activities at the STEM on Station website. See you next time. Well, those guys are nice little play on words with their STEM on Station and STEM on Strations and things like that. So, do you think you would ever like to go to outer space? Yes. Why? Uh, because I think it would be fun. You think it'd be fun? Yeah. What, 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 do you, what would you like to do in outer space? So, if I was in the, the, the space spaceship, station? I would, I would, I would bounce around. You'd bounce around like a bounce yeah. house and stuff like that? Yeah. And when I was little, um, what do you mean when you were little? You think you like an old lady now or something? No. Well, well, uh, well, when I was like two or something. Okay, when you were younger. Um, so I wished I want to fly to the moon. And then I remember it since. So you remember that? Yes. So this is something you've wanted to do for a long time? Yes. And how old are you now? Eleven. You're eleven years old? Yes. So I would say that within your lifetime, there's probably going to be a lot of people and a lot more travel to the moon. What do mm -hmm. you think? Yes. There's something that you think you might want to pursue later on when you get a little older? Yeah. All right. Well, guess what? Before you do that, I have some other math problems for you to do. You ready? Okay. All right. Back over to the board. You and Cindy are going to work on another one of these. Okay. So, split it up. Yeah. Yes, that's how you do it. Okay. So, you. Okay. So, this is the width. This is the height. This is the this is the length. Okay. And that's the height. So let me ask you this before you go on. See how you drew your line right here? Yes. So if we use this as the height, that's really all of this. Oh, right? Oh yeah. So we only want this much. So which number should we use instead? Two. There you go. Oh. Okay. Yep, multiply it. Oh, <laughs> that was harsh. Okay, so 10 times 10 is 100, times 2 is 200. Okay, so now we work on part A, and then this is B. Okay. Okay, so we go, okay, so if that's 2, then we do 6 minus 2 equals 4. Okay. Which is over there. Which is over there, yeah. So, we would do... So, we would do this. This would be the... 
height. Okay. Then this would be the. Oh, we help you out. You can reach it. <laughs> <laughs> then, so that would be the height. That would be the length. Then this would be the. Okay. Okay. So we do. It it, it can work either way. So I'll just do 10 times 3. So 10 times 3 is 30. Then I take off the zero, like I'll, pu I'll put it in my pocket. Okay. <laughs> and I'll do 4 times four times 3 is 12. Then I take the zero out of my pocket and I stick it on the number, which is 120. Nice job. I can't help but see your little face right here. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderfully done. So explain a little bit about your, what you were thinking and how you were doing the calculations about this, putting stuff in your pocket and stuff again. Okay, so I think, so this is what I think. So I think like this. So I could just do, I could just do three times 10 or four times 10. That would be like 40 or 30. Then I take the, then I'll take then I'll take the zero in my pocket. Then I w then I do then I'll do three times four is twelve. Then I stick it back on. And that's a strategy that has worked for you for a long time. Yes. Do you remember when you learned to do that? Um, I didn't really learn it. I just did it. You just did it. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter when you learned it or when you did it, <laughs> as long as you can still do it, right? Yeah. All right. Nicely done. So erase the board. Do you feel as though you have a pretty good handle on doing these types of problems now? Yes. So when you start doing these in class later on this week, do you think you're going to be able to help out your teacher? Yes. Did you want to, I, I think you said you wanted to say hi. Did you want to say hi real quick to your teacher, whoever that is? Hi, Ms. McNallis. This is my, this is your student. You know me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now. I know that when you were, before we went on, you said that you hadn't done anything with percents yet. No. Fractions, decimals, and percents are a big part of fifth grade. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you know, what do you know about fractions right now? A lot. Such right. as? Uh, so, okay. So, for example, five over five equals one whole. Then... It's really easy. You can divide, you can multiply, you can subtract, you can add, you can do addition. It's really easy. So you can use so for division. This is what my teacher calls it. She says flip it and switch it. So we do uh, can you give me like two fractions? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to do an example. So you want to divide these? Is this what you're doing? Yes, okay. Dividing. Cuz this is the only time you little Switch it and flip it thing oh. is going to work. Okay, so I'm just going to turn this into like a whole number. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> hold on, sister. You didn't tell us that. Oh. Leave it up there. Five over six. Five yeah, leave it there. Six. Yeah, we're going to go with this. We'll do okay. your whole number later. Yeah, okay. Give okay. me some room there. So we would flip it and switch it. Okay. So for this, we change it into six over five. And then we switch it, then we do multiplication, then we can cross cancel. So that would be one, that would be two, so, that, so then that would be two fifths. And there you go. Do you know why you switch it and flip it? Um, so you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, so you can do it. All right, so there's other ways it's to do it also. So maybe Cindy <laughs> wants to talk to you. Like, because you work with... She just named it as reciprocal. There you go. That's impressive, too. All right. So you want the reciprocal. Yes. So because you do these with junior high students also. Yes. So what you're doing in fifth grade, guess when you're going to do it again? We do it with negatives again in seventh grade. Oh, wow. And I bet you do it in sixth grade, too. Hmm. And you'll do it in eighth grade. Oh, yep. And you'll do it in ninth grade. Every grade. And then you'll keep there using you go. it. Yes. All right. So you know a little bit about fractions. A lot. A kind lot. Kind of. <clears throat> what about if I have put seven over four? So explain that to me if you would. What do you need to do there? You would have to, so this, 
Yeah, we would have to make it a mixed number. All right, so show Cindy how to do that. Okay, so I think, I mean not think, so I know that four times two is eight, that's too big. So we just do equals one, and then we do, so then we do seven minus four equals three, then we do three fourths. Okay. You feeling pretty good about that? Yes. All right, so now what I'd like you to do is take the fraction and turn it into a decimal. <gasps> Yay, okay. So I know that four times 25 is 100. Then we do three times 25. So 100, that's 75. So then that'll be one. All right, Slickster. So you went from fraction to decimal, now turn it into a percent. Oh, uh. I'm guessing? Well, you're guessing. I, I thought you knew this stuff. Well, I don't know percentages. Well, now you do, because you obviously know what you're doing, okay? Oh, okay. What is the, what is, if you're taking a test, what's the highest score you can get? 100. That's the whole thing, right? Yes. If you got them all right, if I have the whole thing, I have 100%. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you get 175% of something then? Well, it would have to be 200%. Then you got some wrong on the math quiz then. <laughs> or what if there was a bon bonus questions? Yeah, bon bonus questions. Oh, okay. So, so you have Cindy work with you a little bit on the 1.75, what that means, and how that becomes 175% instead of bonus question. <laughs> All right, so you girls take that over for a moment. Okay, so um, that reads, so it's just one So do you know what thing. percent means? Percent. So a percent is something like, for example, if I have a sphere and if well, I... I just mean just the words, percent. Oh, percent, it's like part of something. Okay, and the word cent is a certain number. Hundred. Yeah, because there's a hundred years in a century and a hundred mm -hmm. cents and a dollar. So mm -hmm. percent means something out of a hundred. Mm -hmm. So this part was already out of a hundred, yes. right? Which is this part of it. Mm -hmm. And then you have this one whole, yes. which is like you got the whole thing right. Mm -hmm. So that's representing mm -hmm. what percent? Hundred percent. Yeah, so it's really like saying I have a hundred percent and another seventy-five percent. Mm -hmm. So that's one hundred seventy-five percent altogether. Or if you took two quizzes and you got 100% on this quiz and then a 75% a on this quiz, then your teacher adds them Just together. Just add the scores yeah. together? Okay. <laughs> All right, so like Maddie, how old did you say you were? I was, a, I'm 11. You're 11 years old, so you'll be how old next year? 12. All right, clear the board. We're gonna work with the number 12. I mean, so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to write 12% up there. Now, what I'd like you and Cindy to do is represent that as a decimal and a fraction, and if you can simplify it, do that also. Okay, so I think put a 12 right there, do a decimal. Okay. Okay, that's and the decimal. And why did you come up with that? Because I remembered from the 1.75. 1 the 1 okay. Then I just did the opposite of what I did earlier. Okay, and yeah. then what place value, how do you read this place value? 12 hundredths. Which is what percent means, right? Yes. So 12 out of 100. So then it would be hundredths. 12 over 100, like I just so read. So same reasoning, yeah. yeah. Then we can simplify. Let's see here. Let's do four over four. And I'm just going to say, judging from all I've seen of you, you would never get a 12% on your math test. Right? No. <laughs> never. Nope, I can tell. <laughs> but what if it was a 12% out of something else or something, right? <laughs> no, I just meant if we're talking tests. You Overall. Get that. Yes, 12% well, sales like, whoa, whoa, tax. Whoa, or that, right? <laughs> all right. So, is there anything in math class that you've done that has given you difficulty this year? No. 
Well, you seem pretty bright right there, and I'm glad that you are, are open to all of the different things that we are doing. Yes. So are you ready? We're going to give you a couple of problems left to do, but we're going to do it right after this. Hello, I'm Aki Hoshide. And I'm Megan MacArthur. We're astronauts living and working aboard the International Space Station. Have you ever wondered how astronauts orient themselves in space when there is no feeling of up or down? In this episode, we'll discuss the vestibular system and the effects of free fall on our sense of direction up here on Space Station. Let's go try out some experiments with spatial orientation. The vestibular system is the sensor system our brains use to process movement using the perceived pull of gravity structures in our inner ears and through processing visual cues from our eyes. This information is necessary for balance, motion, and spatial orientation. The vestibular system is made up of several parts primarily located in the inner ears in a series of interconnected chambers called the labyrinth. The labyrinth has three semicircular canals, each oriented in a different plane to detect different movements. In the micro-G environment here on the space station, the pull of gravity our body is accustomed to is different, and the vestibular system receives mixed messages. The semicircular canals sense head rotation in space, just as they do on Earth. Because the autolith organs rely on gravity to detect linear motion, they don't function the same way in micro-G as they do on Earth. You've probably experienced similar mixed messages on Earth. Some people feel dizzy when they read a book in a moving car. The structures in your ear pick up on the motion of the car, but your eyes are fixed on the motionless book. These mixed messages can cause dizziness as your brain tries to determine if you're at rest or in motion. We call that dizzy feeling motion sickness. Docking sequence is complete. Welcome to the International Space Station. Endurance copies and docking complete, and happy to be here at the ISS. This is similar to the way many first-time astronauts feel when they arrive on the space station. Up here, we call that space adaptation syndrome, or space motion sickness. This is a period where our bodies are adjusting and orienting to the new freefall environment. One way we fight off space motion sickness is by reducing our body movements until we are acclimated. We also use labels, signs, and the design of the station to help orient ourselves. Lights are positioned up along what we call the overhead, and air intakes are positioned down towards what we call the deck. When we return to Earth, our bodies once again must adapt to perceived change in gravity. Close your eyes and think about where you are right now. Can you determine which way is up with your eyes closed? What about down? Now, open your eyes and think about what signals you receive to help you determine direction. On Earth, we perceive up or down relative to gravity. While in orbit on station, we're essentially in free fall. There isn't a true up. Up could be anywhere. Welcome to Which Way Are You Pointing? Where our astronauts try to figure out their orientation while they're in micro-G. <laughs> They'll have eye masks on and earplugs in to remove those senses. On the space station, gravity has mostly been removed as well. They'll pick an object and see if they can point to it after being spun around. First, some terms you should know. Pitch is shown as an exaggerated nod. Roll is shown as you move your head from shoulder to shoulder. And yaw is shown as if you were shaking your head no. Let's play. Target, ease of flag, rotation, pitch. Oh, sorry, Mark. Let's try again. 
target, ESA flag, rotation, roll. Wrong again, Mark. Okay, Shane, let's see how you do. Target, laptop, rotation, roll. There are just too many missing pieces of their vestibular systems to accurately orient themselves. I encourage you to think about the way your vestibular system helps you respond to information from your environment and take note of what's happening next time you feel a little off balance. Thanks for exploring the effects of Micro-G on the vestibular system with us today. See you next time. All right, more space stuff, huh? Pretty cool. All mm -hmm. right, back over to the board. You're not done yet. Okay. All right. So pick a number between 10 and 99. Mm, well, well, I mean, I mean, one, I mean, wait, wait, 10 and 99? Okay. Uh, 98. 98? Go ahead and write it on the board. So I want you to tell me which is larger or what's going on with it. 98% mm -hmm. of 100 or 100% of 98? 100% out of 98 is big. I mean, it's So it's we big. either have 98% of 100 or 100% of 98. Is one of those bigger? And if so, which one or what's it going on maybe? It would be 100% over 98? So you think 100% of 98 is bigger than 98% of 100? You and Cindy talk about it. I'll give you one minute. Um, so 98% of 100. So right. basically like. Means if there were 100 questions like and you got a 98%, how many did you miss? Like two. So you, it still represents 98. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or 100% of 98. which means how many questions would there be for you to get 100% um, of 98? It, it would have to be 100. Well, I mean, 100 98. Well, 100% is score, right? Yeah, so there'd be 98 questions, yes. and you got 100%, which would be how many questions did you get correct then? Yeah, um, uh, 98. Okay. So this one, we got 98, and that one, we got... 98, so they're equal. Yes. There you go. That's what I wanted you to figure out, right? 98% of 100 is the same thing as 100% of 98. Mm -hmm. Do you see how those two work together? Yes. All right. Come on over here, young lady. Do you know what an ambassador is? Uh, yes. What's an ambassador? Like somebody in charge. Yeah, there you go. So come around this way a little bit. All right. We're going to take a look right there at Aaron and at this other camera. So this is your uniform, and I'm going to move it up a little bit. We can't see anymore, though. But that is your ambassadorship uniform. Sound good? Mm hmm All right. Did you have fun today? Yes. Did you learn a little something? Yes. Excellent. Even better all the way around. Until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and Kern High School District, with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.